What's up guys? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Uchihai and Uzumaki Hybrid? Part 9. Like share and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Renjiro was blissfully unaware of the stir he had caused in the upper echelons of Kanoha's leadership. After a long day filled with socializing, he finally made his way back home at dusk. Sama had taken him and Hiro to Tuchi's ramen stand, where they shared stories and laughter, enjoying each other's company until the later hours of the day. The camaraderie was comforting, but it had also drained Renjiro's social battery. Once back in his modest apartment, Renjiro didn't bother with any further activities. The fatigue from the recent missions had accumulated, and the social interactions had left him mentally exhausted. There was only one thing on his mind. Sleep. Without hesitation, he collapsed onto his bed, surrendering to the sweet embrace of slumber. When Renjiro finally awoke, it was well past noon the next day. The sunlight filtering through the gaps in his curtains told him how high the sun was in the sky. He groaned as he stretched, feeling the lingering fatigue in his muscles. That was a long couple of hours and I'm still tired, he muttered to himself, forcing his body out of bed. The temptation to crawl back under the covers was strong, but he knew he had too many things to do. No rest for the wicked, Renjiro sighed. After a quick series of light exercises to wake up his body, Renjiro began to plan his day. First off, I need to run some errands he muttered, as he put off his usual training gear. I don't know when the whole squad leader thing will start, but I need to fix my bus staff. I might need it soon. I also need to see if there are any advanced training weights available, he continued, fiddling with the seal on his arm that he usually wore when he wasn't on a mission. The seal, which added about 900 pounds, approximately 400 kilograms of weight, was becoming too easy for him to handle, making his physical training less effective. But why should I bother buying other seals when I can just modify it? Renjiro wondered aloud. He had created resonator components to enhance his seals, but time constraints had prevented him from applying these modifications to all his training equipment. Balancing his development in ninjutsu, taijutsu, and fuinjutsu was becoming increasingly difficult. The advanced techniques he was learning demanded more time and effort, not to mention his duties within the force. His only saving grace was his ability to create shadow clones. I miss the days when shadow clones were only for spamming my jutsu training. Now I can't even survive without them. Renjiro thought with a wry smile as he created five shadow clones. He assigned the first clone to get his bus staff repaired, and the second to search for more advanced training weights, reasoning that modifying the best available weights would be more worthwhile. The remaining three clones were tasked with working on his stock of seals. He had depleted his personal stash of explosive tags and other seals during the past two weeks and needed to prepare more for future missions. Additionally, restocking the seals he sold was crucial since the income from his sales supplemented his earnings from the force and his meager clan allowance. Now that everything is sorted, I need to learn a few jutsus, Renjiro said to himself. While I'm proud of my speed, especially with the Sharingan helping me hold my own against powerful shinobi, Ige proved that I need to be faster. He was too damn fast. Renjiro recalled the encounter with a mix of frustration and determination. He knew that his survival during that exchange was due to Minato's timely intervention and the fact that Ige seemed to prioritize speed over raw attacking power. But now the issue is, how do I get faster? Renjiro mused, racking his brain for solutions. Maybe I can try using Fuinjutsu to somehow enhance my speed. He began to think aloud but quickly dismissed the idea. That would be too time-consuming and require a lot of trial and error. Maybe I can remove one of my eyes and focus on getting more pairs of Sharingans so that I can unlock my Mangekyo since it improves the base Sharingan capabilities. 
Just as quickly as the idea popped into his mind, Renjiro shut it down. Last time, my eye took too long to heal, and I don't know if it will be done by the time the squad leader stuff begins. Even if it does heal, this is just a theory, and there's no guarantee it will help me unlock my Mangekyo. Renjiro pondered his options. Now that I think about it, Ige was using some lightning release jutsu. Maybe I can go and ask Momo for some guidance since Uno seemed well-versed in lightning release during our fight. He also remembered a strange conversation he had with Shima back in Mount Mayaboku about the different types of senjutsu. I should also ask her about that. She should be able to shed more light on what kind of senjutsu she practices. Renjiro noted. The mention of senjutsu brought another task to mind that he had been postponing. I need to do this now or I might keep forgetting it. Renjiro decided, creating another shadow clone, which quickly left his home. That should settle it, Renjiro thought, feeling slightly more organized. He had just remembered that he still had Ohashi's corpse stored and had planned to go through his memories to understand how the Kuragane clan manipulated natural energy. Hence he sent his clone to the sensory core base, where he had started his path to becoming a sensory nin. Renjiro had maintained close ties with Sato Yamanaka, the head of the facility, even after leaving the academy. Training there wouldn't be much of an issue, and observing the Yamanaka clan shinobis would help him learn their techniques later, necessary for reading Ohashi's memories. Again, I can't go to the floating islands now since I still need to know how much time I have left to prepare for the squad leader contest or whatever it will be. I really need to get this done as it will impact all my moves in the near future, Renjiro said to himself. Back to the jutsu that I need, I also need more destructive jutsus, the dash his thoughts were interrupted by a knock on the door. Who could that be now? Renjiro wondered, slightly annoyed as he went to open the door. When he opened it, he found a young boy standing there. It was Achiha Abido, his squad leader's son. Renjiro stood at his front door, stunned. What is he doing here? He thought, watching Achiha Abido standing before him. Of all the people he could expect to show up, Abido was at the bottom of the list. Heck, Renjiro doubted if he was on the list. Hey, Renjiro-sama. The prepubescent boy greeted cheerfully. How are you, Abido? Renjiro responded, trying to mask his surprise. I'm good. My father has been busy recently, so he tasked me with passing a message to you, Abido said with a broad grin. Renjiro had a hunch that Fujioka sent Abido, but the news of his busyness puzzled him. Didn't he just retire? Renjiro wondered. What is the message about? He asked, leaning slightly against the doorframe. He said something about a squad head. I can't completely remember, but he mentioned that it will begin two weeks from now, Abito replied, fidgeting slightly. Two weeks? I can work with that, Renjiro thought, nodding. However, Abito continued, since I have been coming here every day for the last week to see if you are around, it will actually begin a week from now. Huh? He has been coming here daily for the last week, Renjiro wondered. Thank you for the information, Abito. Is there anything else? Renjiro nodded and asked, trying to keep his tone neutral. Abito shook his head. No, that's all. Without another word, the young boy turned and quickly scurried away. Renjiro watched him go a complex mix of emotions stirring within him. He's quite a young, innocent boy. Should I kill him? Renjiro afforded to think. The thought came unbidden, but Renjiro did not dismiss it immediately. He knew the threat Abito would grow up to pose not just to the village but to the entire shinobi world. I would be nipping a huge problem in the bud, Renjiro thought grimly. He knew that if things were left unchanged, they would likely be on opposing sides in the future. Dealing with Abito now could make things easier later on. But would it really help? Renjiro pondered. Madara might simply choose another Uchiha to manipulate, and without Abito's involvement, the events I know might unfold differently, causing me to lose my edge of knowing the future. It all boiled down to whether Renjiro was selfish enough, scared enough, or powerful enough. If Renjiro were selfish enough, he would choose not to interfere with current events, ignoring everything while slowly accumulating his power. This would enable him to use his knowledge of the future to gain even more strength. However, this was easier said than done. 
He was bonding with people in Kanoha, and the thought of losing Kushina did not sit well with him. If Renjiro were scared enough of the potential and danger Ibido would hold in the future, then eliminating him now would be the best option regardless of what the future holds. But this all depended on whether Renjiro was powerful enough. If he was, he would be able to deal with the aftermath of his interference. He knew it would be more than just Ibido's death. He would have to face Madara sooner than expected. There's no need to think about future bridges I might cross, Renjiro said aloud, shaking his head to clear it. While a week is less than what I expected or wanted, I can work with it. He paced back and forth, contemplating his next steps. Besides my speed, I think my offensive power needs to improve, he mused. Should I learn the Raisin Shuriken? Renjiro pondered this for a moment. Renjiro said, That is a given, but I first need to ensure that I master adding other chakra natures to the base Raisin Gan. I want to see what different reactions it would result in. He walked over to a nearby chair and sat down, deep in thought. I also remember seeing Asa use his lava release, Renjiro thought. While it was terrifying going against such a powerful shinobi, his chakra, or rather the chakra powering his Kekiai Genkai, was different. Asa was one of the few people Renjiro was proud to have faced. Not only did he respect Asa's strength, but his Kekiai Genkai was a perfect combination of terrifying and intriguing. The intense heat of Asa's lava had caused Renjiro to suffer burns and scalds even while trying his best to dodge the attacks. Lava release should be a combination of both fire and earth chakra natures, right? Maybe I should start trying to create my own Kekiai Genkai, Renjiro mused. Combining my fire and wind chakra natures should result in scorch release. I'm sure that trying this out will be far from easy. So how should I attempt it? Renjiro concluded. I'm not sure if it was only Pakura who had scorch release, but maybe if I can track down someone with a similar ability, it will surely make things easier for me. With that, he sat down in a lotus position, closing his eyes to focus. Let's see. Ace's chakra whenever he used any lava attacks was some sort of amalgamation. Should I combine my chakra from the onset? Or should I do it the other way around? Hours passed as Renjiro concentrated, sweat beating on his forehead. He cycled through various combinations of his fire and wind chakra, trying to merge them harmoniously. However, despite his best efforts, the two elements refused to blend smoothly. Frustration gnawed at him, but he continued to push himself, determined to unlock the potential within him. What am I doing wrong? Renjiro couldn't help but think. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away, in a remote shack nestled deep within a dense forest, a group of shinobi were gathered. The shack was sparsely furnished, with only the bare essentials. The air was thick with tension, and the walls seemed to hum with anticipation. The shinobi, wearing plain clothing devoid of any symbols indicating their allegiance, all sported armbands of different colors. Some were deep in thought, while others fidgeted with their weapons, their nerves on edge as they waited. Finally, their weight bore fruit as one shinobi's eyes snapped open. The room fell silent, all eyes turning to him. Immediately, a question was posed. Did you see their identities? The shinobi who had been in a trance-like state nodded slowly. Yes, I saw them. There were four of them. Three men and one woman. Another shinobi, who had been sharpening a kanai, looked up, his eyes narrowing. Do you think they're from one of the major villages? The first shinobi shook his head. Yes, the one who killed Yasu had a forehead protector belonging to Kanoha. A murmur of concern rippled through the group. Kanoha did this? One of them asked, trying to confirm what Kaya was insinuating. Kaya, who everyone was looking at, nodded his head. The apparent leader of the group, a tall man with a scar running down his left cheek, spoke. Did you notice anything else? Any distinguishing features? Or at the very least, can you describe how they looked? Yes, I can, Kaya said. All these were mercenaries belonging to the Iron Fong mercenaries, or at least what was left of it. Contrary to what Yano and Minato thought, there were more than just Jounins who were not at the base when they attacked the mercenaries. The three Jounins unaccounted for were heading three groups of Chunins and Jenins on a mission, and it was only after more than a week that they managed to regroup. Once they did, 
they all waited for Kaya to shed more light on what happened to their base. Not because Kaya was a Jounin who could be depended upon as a leader, in actual sense, Kaya was just a Chunin in the organization. However, his sister had been among those who had died in the attack against their base. Kaya had done something remarkable moments ago. He used one of his clan's techniques that allowed one to view the last memories of a person before they died. This ability only worked on Sido clan members, and the closer they were to the deceased, the better the technique would work. This ability was very versatile since it depended on one's chakra to trace the connection they had with their target. So even if Minato and his squad had stored the bodies of the Iron Fong mercenaries, the technique could still work. The memories that Kaya had seen belonged to his sister, Yasu, who was impaled by Renjiro. Since Yasu was killed pretty early on in the exchange, all Kaya saw were the three Chunins who he concluded as the ones behind the attack. With Kaya seeing their appearance, the remnants of the Iron Fong mercenaries would shift their focus to identifying the three. Back in Kanoha, Renjiro's nose twitched. Ha! Huh, is someone talking about me? He thought. Shaking off the superstitious thought, he focused on what he was doing. Renjiro was still engrossed in his training. Despite numerous attempts, he had yet to achieve the combination of fire and wind chakra. He let out a frustrated sigh, realizing that this endeavor would require more time and experimentation than he initially thought. I knew it would be hard, but not this hard, Renjiro surmised. I guess if it was easy, Haruzen would already have countless Kekiai Genkais, considering that he mastered the five chakra natures. But he was not one to give up easily. I'll get it eventually, he thought with determination. I just need to keep trying. Renjiro stood up, stretching his tired muscles. I guess with one week, all I should do is focus on my basics. With everything decided, Renjiro got back to work. The week passed in a blur. Renjiro's bus staff was repaired, which was fortunate for him. But other than that, the week was uneventful. Renjiro locked himself in his house and continuously trained both his body, taijutsu, and ninjutsu. He pushed himself to his limits, determined to be ready for whatever lay ahead. On the day of the contest, Renjiro got up early and made his way to the police force base. The contest was going to take place in one of the force's training grounds. It was going to be a closed contest, which Renjiro appreciated. It wasn't that he minded having crowds cheer for their favorites during the contest. He was just more comfortable without them, as it made the stakes higher for him. As Renjiro made his way to the base, he could sense a mild sense of somberness in the village. Something is up, Renjiro thought, raising his brow. He definitely felt that something was wrong but dismissed it and focused on the contest. He quickly arrived at the training ground reserved for the contest. The training ground was a spacious area surrounded by tall trees. The ground was covered in a mix of dirt and grass, worn from countless training sessions and battles. As Renjiro entered the training ground, he saw a multitude of shinobi gathered. His fellow competitors were already there, some were talking, some were stretching, and others were practicing their techniques. The morning sun cast long shadows across the field, the light filtering through the trees surrounding the area. The atmosphere buzzed with anticipation and nervous energy. Renjiro scanned the crowd, his eyes darting from one face to another, searching for someone familiar. Much to his disappointment, he did not locate a single familiar face. Without hesitating, Renjiro quickly joined them, waiting for the event to commence. As Renjiro waited, he couldn't help but listen to a conversation between some of the shinobi beside him. Their voices carried in the crisp morning air, drawing his attention. One of them began, Hey, did you know that they are going to bury him? The other asked, Who? The first one berated his friend, his voice tinged with frustration. The white fang, Who else would I be talking about, you idiot? Hearing this, his friend was surprised and asked, What? He died. Have you been living under a rock? He died some time ago. I was told that he killed himself, his friend answered. I was just focusing on this, but why did he kill himself? He replied. Apparently, they said that he couldn't complete a certain mission. What? How is that possible? He was the most powerful person in the village behind the Hokage. How could he not complete a mission? 
he asked. I don't know. Maybe he was going up against another Kage. Renjiro felt a pang of sorrow and confusion as he listened to the conversation. So it finally happened. But how come I didn't hear about this? I was just with Hiro a week ago. Maybe it happened while we were outside the village. But I am sure he is not taking this news well. Although they never got into details about the events that led to his mission in the story, I would really like to know which mission caused this sort of reaction from such a shinobi who was even more powerful than the Sanans. Just as he was thinking this, a group of people arrived at the training ground. They were ten at most, their presence immediately commanding attention. When Renjiro saw them, he immediately recognized a few of them. Anyone who served in Kanoha's police force would quickly realize that these were the leaders of the police force. Even if they were too slow to catch on, they would still come to this conclusion once they saw Daichi leading the new arrivals. They all moved with the grace of a seasoned shinobi, their every step exuding confidence and authority. Their expressions were serious and focused. As soon as the group arrived, they called out to everyone present at the training ground. One of them, a stern-looking man with graying hair in his temples, stood at the center of the training ground. He raised a hand, calling for silence. His voice, deep and resonant, carried easily over the assembled shinobi. Welcome, everyone. Today's contest will determine the new squad leaders. You've all trained hard for this, and now is the time to show your worth. As Iwata, one of the three commanders of the Kanoha police force besides Fugaku and another shinobi, continued his speech, his voice took on a more encouraging tone. You've all worked hard to be here, and today is your chance to prove your worth. This contest isn't just about strength, it's about leadership, strategy, and the will to protect our village. Remember, each of you has the potential to be a great leader. Show us your determination, your skill, and your heart. The gathered shinobi stood a little taller, the encouraging words bolstering their spirits. Iwata's commanding presence and inspiring speech set a tone of respect and anticipation. He then notified the shinobi that the whole contest was divided into three parts, with the first part involving a battle royale. This is for trimming the fat, Iwata stated bluntly, causing murmurs to spread among the group of squad leader aspirants. The idea of a battle royale was daunting, and the term trimming the fat made the stakes clear, only the best would advance. Why did they only inform us of the first part? Renjiro wondered. Iwata continued, informing the shinobi before him that they would be grouped into squads of about 20, and only the top five from every squadron would move forward. Renjiro furrowed his brow, contemplating the logistics. Wait, how many are we here? He thought. Activating his chakra field, he assessed the levels of his competitors. He noticed a variety of reactions, a few sensed his chakra field but found it hard to trace it back to him, while others did not react at all. Most of us are Chunin, although I sense some Genin here and there. Why would anyone encourage a Genin to apply for this? Either the Genin who applied are talented or just stupid. Renjiro thought, shaking his head slightly. Iwata finished by saying, The last five people to remain in their assigned combat areas will proceed to the next stage. You have a time limit of 40 minutes to complete this round. If more than five people are still standing after that, all of you will be disqualified. As future squad leaders, you must be decisive. Well, that is a bit harsh but fair, Renjiro thought, nodding slightly at the logic behind the rule. Iwata informed them that only one group would go at a time, as all their superiors in the force would be the ones to judge them and score them. The aspirants were then told to draw numbers, which would determine which round they would go in. Renjiro drew number 79, meaning he would go in the final round. While I wanted to get done with this quickly, at least I have time to observe my other competitors. Renjiro mused, folding his slip of paper and tucking it away in one of his pockets. The aspirants then made space as two shinobi created thick earth walls over a significant portion of the training ground. The walls rose with a rumbling noise, enclosing the battlefield in a formidable arena. One of the shinobi reminded the aspirants, You are only to use light force. Anyone who uses lethal force will be immediately disqualified. No killing? Well, that makes sense, but if people do not fight to the death, then are the stakes really high? 
Renjiro thought before he paused and quickly reined those thoughts back in. It seemed he was growing a bit uncaring towards human life, something that was concerning. Shifting his focus, Renjiro watched as the first group of 20 shinobi stepped forward, nerves and determination etched on their faces. The ground beneath them was uneven, with patches of grass and dirt, and small rocks scattered around. The thick earth walls loomed high, creating an arena that felt both claustrophobic and expansive. The signal to begin was given, and the first group launched into action. The clash of kanai and shuriken filled the air, mingling with the grunts and yells of the combatants. One shinobi, a tall man with a scar across his cheek, moved with impressive speed, dodging attacks and countering with swift strikes. Another, a petite woman with short black hair, expertly wielded her dual blades, her movements a dance of lethal precision. Interesting, Renjiro observed carefully, noting their techniques and strategies. Some focused on brute strength, while others relied on agility and quick thinking. One shinobi, a genin by the looks of him, displayed surprising skill in evasion, narrowly avoiding hits while countering with well-placed strikes. Maybe he's one of the talented ones, Renjiro thought, impressed by the shinobi's performance who was not that behind in age from Renjiro. As the time limit approached, the numbers dwindled. The once crowded arena now had only six remaining shinobi, each one visibly exhausted yet resolute. The scarred man and the petite woman were among them, their prowess evident in their standing. In a final burst of speed and strategy, the scarred man managed to disarm two of his opponents, while the petite woman cornered another, forcing a surrender. Are they working together? Renjiro thought. With the signal from the judges, the match ended, and the remaining five stood victorious. The crowd of aspirants murmured in approval, impressed by the display. The next group stepped forward, and the process repeated. Renjiro continued to watch, analyzing the different fighting styles and tactics. He noticed a trend, those who combine ninjutsu with taijutsu seem to fare better, using their versatility to adapt to various situations. One shinobi, a burly man with earth-style techniques, created barriers and traps to control the battlefield, demonstrating a keen strategic mind. Each round brought new insights. By the time it was Renjiro's turn, he felt a mixture of anticipation and calm. He knew what to expect and had a plan in mind. As he stepped into the arena, he felt the weight of the earth walls around him, the ground firm beneath his feet. The other 19 shinobi in his group eyed each other warily, the tension palpable. Some had expressions of determination, others of steely resolve. Renjiro took a deep breath, centering himself. Stay focused, stay sharp, he reminded himself. Begin. When the signal was given, chaos erupted. The air filled with the sounds of clashing kanai, the grunts of combatants, and the swift movements of shinobi. However, Renjiro remained motionless, standing tall amidst the frenzy. His senses heightened. There's no need to waste energy, he thought, his eyes scanning the battlefield with a calm intensity. I'd rather have them come to me than go to them. For the first couple of minutes, the fight raged around him without anyone daring to challenge his seemingly aloof stance. He watched as shinobi engaged in high-paced, aggressive combat, their sharingans flaring as they read each other's moves and countered with precision. The ground was a blur of rapid footwork and the clanging of metal against metal. Dust kicked up in small clouds as shinobi leapt and spun, their movements almost too fast to follow. Renjiro observed the skirmishes, noting the strengths and weaknesses of his competitors. He saw one shinobi using a combination of fire and wind jutsu to create a blazing whirlwind, which another countered with a powerful water technique. The clash of elements was spectacular, but Renjiro remained unimpressed. He knew conserving his energy was key. After a few minutes, a Chunin, emboldened by the heat of battle, dared to launch a kanai at Renjiro. Whoosh! The kanai whistled through the air, aimed straight for Renjiro's head. With a swift, fluid motion, Renjiro dodged the kanai, his body moving inches to the side. He countered with a well-placed kick, the force of which sent the attacker sprawling out of bounds. 
The impact was strong enough to make the attacker crash out of the earth walls which also served as the bounds, marking his elimination. Renjiro's strategy of maintaining a low profile became increasingly difficult as the number of competitors dwindled. His stillness and non-engagement began to draw attention. Despite this, he managed to keep a low profile, swiftly and efficiently eliminating another shinobi with minimal effort. His strikes were precise and powerful, sending his opponents crashing out of the combat area. Now, with only eight shinobi remaining, the arena grew quieter. Among the remaining competitors were two women who looked almost like carbon copies of each other. They had matching build, height, and facial features, with the only noticeable difference being their hair colors and attire. One had short, fiery red hair and wore a crimson outfit, while the other had long, raven black hair and wore a deep blue ensemble. These twins, known as Akira and Yumi, had eliminated a majority of the competitors in their round. Their synchronized attacks were a sight to behold. They moved in perfect harmony, their strikes complementing each other flawlessly. Akira specialized in close combat with swift, powerful taijutsu moves, while Yumi used her chakra control to cast Jinjutsu and disorient her opponents. Casting Jinjutsu on people with Sharingans is pretty bold. The fact that she succeeded just shows how dangerous they are. Renjiro thought, as the eight remaining shinobi eyed each other, assessing their competition, the differences in their states became apparent. Some were panting heavily, visibly exhausted from the intense combat. Others, like Renjiro, appeared calm and composed, as if they were merely taking a stroll. The twins, Akira and Yumi, gave each other a knowing nod. They had noticed that Renjiro had contributed the least to eliminating others and decided he must be hiding something, either power or cunningness. They moved towards him with synchronized precision, their eyes narrowing in determination. He's either skated through without anyone noticing, or he's powerful. Either way, eliminating him would remove a significant threat. Akira thought as she dashed forward, her sister Yumi following closely behind. The twins moved like a well-oiled machine, their attacks coming in swift, coordinated bursts. Akira lunged at Renjiro with a powerful punch, while Yumi cast a Jinjutsu to disorient him. But Renjiro was ready. With minimal effort, he sidestepped Akira's punch and dispelled Yumi's Jinjutsu with a burst of chakra. With a swift, powerful kick, Renjiro sent Akira crashing through the earth wall her body slamming through it with a thud that echoed across the arena. Yumi's eyes widened in shock, but before she could react, Renjiro turned and delivered a similar kick to her. The force of the blow sent her hurtling through the same earth wall, landing next to her sister, both of them knocked out and eliminated from the competition. I need to work on my precision, Renjiro thought. He had intended to make Yumi land on top of her sister, but unfortunately he couldn't slash well, Coming for me now would be stupid, so I can just chill. Renjiro thought as he assumed a meditative stance and closed his eyes, his breathing steady and controlled. The remaining shinobi watched in awe and confusion. Is he closing his eyes? This thought ran through almost everyone's mind. Renjiro's calm demeanor amidst the chaos made him an enigma, a puzzle that none were eager to solve directly. They opted to avoid him, focusing on each other instead. The battle continued with Shinobi clashing in a desperate bid to be among the final five. One by one, the competitors fell until only five remained. When the signal was finally given, indicating the end of the round, Renjiro opened his eyes and stood up. Finally, Renjiro thought, I told you about him. Fujioka was practically beaming with pride, boasting to his colleagues. Renjiro is talented. I knew this whole thing wouldn't be a challenge for him. Fujioka had placed a bet with some of his colleagues, who were also evaluating the candidates. They each had their own favorites in the competition, but Fujioka had confidently backed Renjiro. Now, he was reaping the rewards of his faith. One of his colleagues, a burly man named Takashi, begrudgingly reached into his pocket and pulled out a handful of Ryo, handing it over to Fujioka. Yeah, yeah, he just got lucky this time, Takashi grumbled. But there's no way he's getting through the next stage. Mark my words. Another colleague, a woman named Now, nodded in agreement as she handed over her payment. He's good, but he hasn't faced the real challenges yet. 
The next stage will weed out the rest. Fujioka chuckled, pocketing the money. We'll see about that. You all said the same this morning. We don't even know what will happen in the next stage. We only know what they would be tested. Or do they know? If they do, I can take advantage of this opportunity since I am sure Renjiro will succeed. Fujioka wondered. But if you still believe so we could make another bet. Fujioka smiled as he proposed. As Renjiro made his way out of the combat area, he noticed someone approaching him. He sighed inwardly, mildly irritated. Ha! Huh, who is this? He thought. Renjiro, it has been a long time, said the young woman who had walked up to him. She was as tall as Renjiro's shoulder and had her black hair tied up neatly. Renjiro looked at her, puzzled. Why is she talking as if I know her? He furrowed his brow and asked, Um, who are you? He tried his best to sound polite, but his tone came off more brusque than intended. The lady looked slightly annoyed. What? You don't remember me? She asked. Seeing the confused look on Renjiro's face, she continued, I am Uchiharamari. That did not ring any bells for Renjiro and it only made his confusion deepen. Am I supposed to know her? Was there someone called Amari from the Uchiha clan in the story? I don't think so, he thought. As the silence stretched, Amari's annoyance grew. We fought during the Chunin exams in the Forest of Death, remember? She huffed. Realization dawned on Renjiro, but before he could respond, Amari stormed off, muttering under her breath. Why did she walk up to me and then storm off? People sure are strange nowadays. Renjiro mused as he watched her leave. After the initial round was over and the remaining competitors had regrouped, Iwata called for the twenty aspirants who were moving on to the next stage. He handed each of them a scroll. Those who had been eliminated were allowed to leave, but many chose to stay and watch the rest of the contest unfold. Eager to see how their friends and rivals would fare, Renjiro noticed Amari among the twenty shinobi proceeding to the next stage. Oh! That crazy girl also managed to survive her round. He thought with a touch of amusement. He received his scroll and unfurled it, expecting some sort of message or instruction. Instead, he found it blank. Are they supposed to do something? He wondered, turning it over in his hands. Iwata, standing tall before the remaining competitors, addressed them. The scrolls in your hand will be useful in the next part. Renjiro looked around, seeing similar expressions of curiosity and confusion on the faces of the others. The tension in the air was palpable as Iwata continued. You will have to get as many scrolls from each other. However, you also must not remain with the same scroll you were handed in the beginning. Murmurs of confusion and speculation spread through the group. One shinobi, a tall young man with spiky hair, raised his hand and asked, How are we supposed to do that? Iwata smirked, his eyes glinting with amusement. That is for you to decide. You have an hour to complete the task. With that, he turned and walked away, leaving the aspirants to figure it out on their own. The group of aspirants erupted into hushed conversations, trying to piece together the meaning of Iwata's cryptic instructions. Renjiro, however, remained silent, standing still and observing. There's got to be more to this he thought, trying to decipher the underlying purpose of the test. Suddenly, a commotion broke out. One shinobi, a muscular young man, decided to take matters into his own hands. He lunged at another competitor, a smaller shinobi with quick reflexes. The smaller shinobi dodged just in time, his eyes wide with surprise. Hey, what are you doing? The smaller shinobi shouted, but the larger one didn't respond. He was determined to get that scroll. Whack! The larger shinobi swung a punch, which the smaller shinobi barely managed to block. Renjiro watched the chaos unfold, his mind racing. They're going about this all wrong. If everyone starts fighting, we'll waste too much time and energy. There has to be a better way. Meanwhile, Daichi, who was watching from the sidelines, turned to Fugaku, who stood beside him. Why didn't Iwata just tell them the whole point of the test? He asked, frowning. Fugaku, his arms crossed and his expression serious, replied, We are testing their composure and adaptability. If we have to spell out the picture for them, 
then there is no need for them to become squad leaders. Minato, standing nearby, nodded in agreement. The real challenge is for them to understand the objective and find the best way to achieve it. This isn't just about fighting, it's about strategy. Daichi mulled over their words, his eyes narrowing as he continued to watch the aspirants. Interesting, all this managed to happen because of Fugaku. Daichi was already delegating some of his tasks as the clan head to prepare him for what was to come in the future as so far. The Uchina clan head had never been disappointed. Back on the training ground, Renjiro was deep in thought. We have to give up our current scroll and get others, but Iwata did not say we have to fight them, right? His mind raced as he considered the possibilities. As the first scuffles broke out among the aspirants, Renjiro remained still, observing. One aspirant, a determined-looking young woman, managed to wrestle a scroll from another competitor. The struggle was intense, with grunts of effort and the dull thud of bodies hitting the ground. Give it to me! She shouted, yanking the scroll free. The other aspirant, now scroll-less and visibly frustrated, glared at her but made no move to retaliate immediately. Renjiro's eyes flicked over to another pair of shinobi who were arguing heatedly. We need to figure this out together, one of them insisted, but his partner seemed unconvinced clutching his scroll protectively. It was then that an idea sparked in Renjiro's mind. He looked around and spotted Amari, who was fending off another shinobi trying to grab her scroll. Hey, Amari! Renjiro shouted, his voice cutting through the noise. Amari turned to look at him, her eyes wide with surprise. Take my scroll and give me yours! Amari hesitated for a moment, her eyes darting between Renjiro and the shinobi attacking her. What is he planning? She thought, but she didn't have time to ponder. She ducked under a punch, spun around, and dashed towards Renjiro. Renjiro held out his scroll, and Amari quickly handed hers to him. They exchanged scrolls in a swift motion, their hands brushing for a brief second. Thanks, Renjiro said, giving her a quick nod before stepping back. Amari looked at the scroll in her hand, then back at Renjiro. Why did you? She began, but Renjiro interrupted. I don't think the point is to fight for the scrolls, Renjiro explained quickly. Iwata didn't say we had to fight. He said we had to get as many scrolls as possible and not remain with our original ones. So, let's trade and move on. Amari nodded slowly, understanding dawning in her eyes. He might be onto something, she thought. As the two moved away from the center of the chaos, they noticed a few other shinobi who seemed to have caught onto the idea. They were trading scrolls with each other, avoiding unnecessary conflict. The fighting continued for those who hadn't figured it out yet, but a small group of shinobi were now working more strategically. Amari looked at Renjiro and asked, Should we trade with other people? Renjiro paused, contemplating their next move. While we have done the barest of minimums, what did they mean by as many scrolls as possible? What are they trying to test us for? He wondered. The instructions were deliberately vague, leaving room for interpretation. Renjiro's eyes scanned the remaining competitors. They also said that we are to get as many scrolls as we can in any way possible, so they did not lock out the use of force. There's no way you can convince your competitors to just hand their scrolls to you. With a sense of clarity, he concluded their best course of action. No, we don't have to... Renjiro finally answered Amari, his tone decisive. Amari, clearly surprised, raised an eyebrow. Why? Didn't they say that? Just trust me on this, Renjiro interrupted. You didn't even remember who I am. How do you expect me to trust you? Amari thought, feeling a pang of annoyance, but she held her tongue. She was aware that voicing her thoughts wouldn't be productive now. As Daichi watched from the sidelines, a flicker of interest lit his face. It seems that they have caught on, he mused, impressed by Renjiro's ability to see through the test's complexities. Amari decided to follow Renjiro's plan. They moved deliberately, neither making any significant moves nor attracting unnecessary attention. Occasionally, a shinobi would target them, hoping to snatch their scrolls. Each time, Renjiro and Amari defended themselves efficiently, their movements coordinated and precise. 
Renjiro's strategy seemed to be working. By not aggressively pursuing more scrolls, they avoided the brunt of most of the conflict and conserved their energy. As the hour drew to a close, they were signaled to stop. Time's up, a proctor declared, his voice cutting through the remnants of the battle noise. As the chaos of the exercise wound down, Iwata stepped forward, his presence commanding the attention of every shinobi present. His stern expression spoke volumes before he even began to speak. Iwata's voice rang out, cutting through the murmurs and idle chatter that had settled over the group. Listen up! He barked, silencing everyone instantly. Not everything can be solved by force. A true leader must know when to compromise and when to be aggressive. Iwata continued addressing the group. Those who have multiple scrolls and have successfully traded their original ones will move on to the final stage. The rest of you, thank you for your participation. Your efforts have been noted, and you should take pride in your performance. He let that sink in for a moment, his gaze sweeping over the assembled shinobi. The point of this exercise was to test your bearing as a leader. Those of you who always resorted to force did not demonstrate the qualities we look for. Leadership is about more than just fighting. It's about strategy, composure, and the ability to make decisions under pressure. Several shinobi exchanged glances, processing Iwata's words. Some looked chastened, while others, like Renjiro, seemed to nod in understanding. Renjiro stood quietly, reflecting on the exercise and Iwata's words. So getting as many scrolls as we could was just to trick us? He wondered. But then again, we could get as many as one scroll by negotiating with our competitors. The Chunin concluded. Iwata continued his tone firm but encouraging. You must understand that brute strength alone will not see you through every challenge. It is the balance between force and diplomacy, aggression and restraint, that defines a true leader. But then they chastised Sukumo for doing what a true leader would do. Oh well, who am I to judge? Renjiro thought as he felt some movements to his side. Amari, standing next to him, turned and said, Thanks, Renjiro. Your strategy really helped us. Among the twenty who had begun the round, only seven had managed to move to the next round with Renjiro and Amari being among them. Renjiro, still processing everything, looked at her and asked, I needed your help, so it wasn't a big deal. But why do you seem so familiar? This innocent question sparked a flash of annoyance in Amari. This idiot, she thought. Without a word, she turned and walked away, leaving Renjiro standing there, puzzled by her reaction. What did I do? Renjiro thought with a confused look on his face. While all this was happening, Fujioka was beaming with joy. He had just won another round of bets, and his colleagues could barely stand him at this point. But why would Fujioka care? He was happy, practically glowing with satisfaction. His thoughts wandered to the rewards of his success. I can finally get Abito those goggles he has been wanting for a long time. But how does an Uchiha have eye issues? I can't wait until he awakens his Sharingan. I am sure he is going to leave a lasting impact on the village. Some of Fujioka's colleagues, grudgingly respectful, congratulated him on Renjiro's performance. You've done a good job guiding him, one of them said, clapping him on the back. Fujioka shook his head, modestly deflecting the praise. Renjiro's talent is all his own. He was this good even before he joined my squad. The break soon ended, and the seven finalists gathered once more. The anticipation was palpable as they assembled for the final stage. The training ground, now cleared of the earlier chaos, felt charged with a new energy. Iwata stood before them again, his presence commanding attention. The final stage is upon us, he announced. This will be the ultimate test of your skills, your strategy, and your resolve. You have all shown great promise, but only a few will be promoted to the squad leader rank. Renjiro glanced around at his fellow competitors. Each of them wore a look of determination, their focus unwavering. Amari was there too, her eyes fixed ahead, and there was a silent resolve in her stance. As they awaited further instructions, Renjiro's mind raced with thoughts of what might come next. We've been tested on our combat abilities, 
our capacity to think strategically and adapt. What more could they throw at us? He wondered. The final stage of the contest was met with palpable anticipation as Iwata's voice broke through the silence. For the final stage, you will do it separately and privately. This announcement sent a ripple of surprise through the crowd, most of whom had been eagerly hoping to witness the culmination of the day's events. Instead, they were left with no choice but to walk away as the seven finalists were ushered into a nearby building. Why does it need to be private? Renjiro wondered as he followed the proctor. The building itself was unremarkable, a stark contrast to the excitement of the training ground. The walls were bare, painted a dull, institutional gray, and the floor was covered with simple, utilitarian tiles. Renjiro was led down a long, dimly lit corridor, the sound of his footsteps echoing in the stillness. After a few moments, they stopped in front of a door. The one leading them turned to Renjiro and said, Enter. Pointing at the door, Renjiro took a deep breath, opened the door, and stepped inside. The room he entered was sparingly decorated. There were two chairs positioned in the center, facing each other, and a small table off to the side. Is this some kind of office? Renjiro wondered. A single, bare light bulb hung from the ceiling, casting a harsh, unforgiving light over everything. Renjiro took a seat in one of the chairs and waited. After what felt like an eternity, the door opened and a man walked in. He was a shinobi, but not one Renjiro recognized. The man took the other seat and offered a curt nod. Good afternoon, Renjiro, he greeted. My name is Shinichi. I will be asking you a few questions. Renjiro nodded back, though he was still puzzled by the setup. Good afternoon, he replied, trying to keep his voice steady. Shinichi leaned back in his chair, his eyes sharp and assessing. Let's start with your experience in the Force. How has your time been so far? Are they interviewing me? Renjiro considered the question for a moment. It's been challenging but rewarding, he said. I've had the opportunity to learn a lot and improve my skills. The missions have been tough, but they've made me a better shinobi. Shinichi nodded, jotting down notes. And what are your duties in the Force? I've been involved in various missions, ranging from reconnaissance to direct combat, Renjiro explained. I've also taken on some leadership roles within my team, guiding and supporting my comrades. The questions continued, each one probing deeper into Renjiro's experiences and mindset. What is the use of all these questions? Renjiro couldn't help but think. It felt like an interrogation, but he couldn't discern the purpose behind it. As the questioning went on, Renjiro started to get a feeling that something was not right. There was a tension in the air, a sense of unease that he couldn't shake. Then, without warning, Shinichi activated his Sharingan, the red eyes gleaming with an unsettling intensity as they stared at Renjiro. Huh? What is he trying to do? Renjiro wondered, staring back at the proctor. Renjiro immediately disturbed his chakra, and only when he did not sense anything wrong did he relax in confusion. A few seconds passed, and Renjiro felt nothing out of the ordinary. He met Shinichi's gaze steadily, refusing to be intimidated. Beads of sweat began forming on Shinichi's forehead. His confident demeanor faltered, replaced by a nervousness that was hard to miss. Congratulations, Renjiro. You passed, he said abruptly, his voice a bit shaky. Without another word, Shinichi stood up and left the room, leaving Renjiro alone and confused. What just happened? He just used his Sharingan and nothing happened? Was it supposed to scare me? Renjiro thought as he stood up and exited the room. As he made his way back to the training grounds, he noticed two of the other six finalists outside the building, both visibly exhausted. One was profusely sweating, and the other was bent over, panting heavily. Well, that was odd, Renjiro thought. He spotted Fujioka among the examiners and felt a strong urge to approach him and ask what was happening. However, he refrained since they were there to judge the contestants. I need to find that girl, what was her name again? Amari, right? Renjiro thought. Fortunately, Amari walked out of the building just as Renjiro was thinking of finding her. She was visibly shaken, her usual composed demeanor replaced by an expression of disquiet. 
Before Renjiro could approach her, Iwata's voice rang out, drawing everyone's attention. It seems that we have our winners. Iwata announced forcing everyone to turn their attention to him. His tone was grave but tinged with satisfaction. Uzumaki Renjiro, Achiha Amari, Achiha Asato, and Achiha Hiroki stepped forward. Renjiro's heart pounded in his chest as he took a step forward, joining Amari and the other two chosen shinobi. Iwata's gaze swept over them, his expression one of pride and approval. Congratulations! You are the new squad leaders in the Kanoha military force. A wave of applause and cheers erupted from the crowd. So it is over just like that? He wondered. He looked around at the other three, who were visibly relieved and elated. Amari's face broke into a rare smile, and Asato and Hiroki exchanged excited glances. As the applause died down, Renjiro turned to Amari, his curiosity getting the better of him. What happened when you entered the room? He asked, his voice low so as not to draw too much attention. Amari's smile faded slightly as she recalled her experience. It was intense, she began recollecting her experience. Meanwhile, inside the nearby building, Shinichi was giving a review of the feedback from the other higher-ups in the force about the finalist candidates to the clan head. He went through each name meticulously, providing detailed assessments of their performance. When he reached Renjiro's name, he paused, his expression thoughtful. Renjiro showed exceptional composure and skill, Shinichi began. He did not exhibit any signs of struggle in the third stage. His ability to remain unaffected by the Jinjutsu was impressive. He demonstrated a high level of mental fortitude and chakra control. Fugaku, who was present during the review, listened intently. When Shinichi mentioned Renjiro's unaffected state during the Jinjutsu, a realization hit Fugaku. He wanted to facepalm but maintained his composed demeanor. How could I forget about such a thing? He thought. Renjiro nodded, his suspicions confirmed. So it was Jinjutsu. I wonder how come I did not sense anything with my chakra. I remember when Fugaku tried to use his on me, at least I was able to feel my chakra moving. Or was it because of the difference in strength between him and Shinichi? He pondered. Renjiro muttered under his breath. Anyway, a win is a win. Fujioka approached Renjiro with a broad smile, clapping him on the shoulder with a firm, reassuring grip. Renjiro, that was impressive. You've proven yourself in every way possible. I'm proud of you. Renjiro, still feeling a bit overwhelmed by the day's events, managed a modest smile. It wasn't like I did much, he said. Frankly, I expected more when I heard about this, but I'll still take this. Renjiro thought, don't sell yourself short, Fujioka replied warmly. You showed exceptional talent and composure. You've earned this. As they walked together, Fujioka turned to Renjiro with a more serious expression. By the way, I noticed you were out of the village a while ago. What happened? The reason that Fujioka asked this was because he knew Renjiro was not on a mission from the force since as his current squad leader, although semi-retired, he would know about that. Renjiro blinked, momentarily caught off guard by the question. He quickly recovered and replied, Minato invited me on a couple of missions. He thought it would be a good experience for me, so we spent two weeks continuously completing missions. While the circumstances that led to Renjiro's current ambiguous squad situation in the Force were distasteful, he took advantage of it and completed missions outside of the Force, something he would not be allowed to do so if his squad was in full capacity. Fujioka nodded, satisfied with the answer, but still curious. I see. I didn't know about those missions. So I was wondering, before Renjiro could respond, Kagami, an old squad member, approached them with a grin. Renjiro, congratulations on becoming a squad leader. Renjiro returned the smile, happy to see a familiar face. Thanks, Kagami. It's been a while. Kagami's eyes twinkled with mischief. Guess what? Hey and I got married. Renjiro's eyes widened in surprise. Really? That's amazing. Congratulations to both of you. Internally, he mused. They weren't even dating when we were in the same squad, and now they're married? But then again, constantly having close encounters with death like most shinobi do, 
can make people act strangely. This is good for them, but it also means I don't have time to waste because if Shursui's parents are now married, he'll probably be born in the next few years. I thought I had a lot of time until the start of the story, but with the way time is quickly moving, I might wake up one day and find the third shinobi war has begun. Kagami continued. I would have invited you to the wedding, but you were out of the village with Minato and the rest of the squad. Renjiro thought, while I would have loved to attend a wedding in this world, I'm not sure we were that close since we were only squad members for a couple of months. The three shinobi chatted a bit more, catching up on old times and exchanging stories. Eventually, they all had to bid their goodbyes since Renjiro was required to attend a meeting with Iwata and Kagami had to leave to attend to his duties. I will take my leave now, Fujioka said with a wave. Good luck with your new responsibilities, Renjiro, Kagami said. Renjiro waved back. Thanks, take care. As he watched them walk away, Renjiro thought, I wonder if I will get to choose my squad members or if the higher-ups will just allocate them to my squad. Renjiro then made his way to the designated meeting room for the orientation. He was the first to arrive and took a seat, waiting for the others. Soon, Amari and the other two new squad leaders, Asato and Hiroki, arrived. They exchanged nods of acknowledgement before taking their seats, and moments later, Iwato entered the room. I guess it is straight to work, Renjiro thought. Congratulations to all of you for making it this far. Iwata began, his voice steady and authoritative. You are now the leaders who will shape the future of our village's military and police force. Your responsibilities are significant, and your actions will set an example for others to follow. He paused, letting the gravity of his words sink in. As squad leaders, you will report to me. I am your immediate superior. It is crucial that you understand the chain of command and adhere to it strictly. Iwata then went on to outline the force's leadership ranks and who the new squad leaders will be answering to from him, all the way to Daichi. Renjiro listened intently, noting how different the structure was from what he had expected. Hmm. Well that's surprising, I thought that when I became a squad leader, I would have to report to Sonoda since I replaced Fujioka, but it seems like things are different. Iwata continued, outlining their duties and expectations. You will be required to submit monthly reports on your squad members, detailing their progress, missions, and other duties. These reports are essential for maintaining the efficiency and effectiveness of our force. Iwata's next words brought a spark of excitement to Renjiro. Tomorrow you will begin your duties by choosing your squad members and meeting rooms. This is your chance to form a team that complements your strengths and covers your weaknesses. As Iwata spoke, Renjiro's mind drifted to his memories of Tobe and Toda. The thought of his late friends brought a pang of sorrow. Frankly, Renjiro would have loved to be in a squad with either of the two late brothers rather than be a squad leader since they were good friends to him and guided him well. Realizing that he was absent-minded, Renjiro quickly refocused on Iwata's words. Renjiro nodded, his thoughts momentarily returning to Tobe and Toda. It seemed that Renjiro had not properly dealt with his grief. But this was not something he was ready to address. He pushed the thoughts aside and concentrated on the task at hand. After Iwata finished the briefing, Renjiro planned to go home and finalize his strategy for selecting his squad members. However, his plans were abruptly interrupted when he sensed a disturbance. A cloaked and masked shinobi from the ANBU appeared before him, causing a ripple of surprise among the others present. Renjiro's eyes narrowed. What is the ANBU doing here? He wondered. The masked shinobi stared directly at Renjiro and said, Uzumaki Renjiro, the Hokage wants to see you. Without another word, the ANBU then disappeared as quickly as he had arrived. Renjiro knew better than to ask questions. He quickly made his way to the Hokage's office by flickering. When he arrived, he was surprised to find several familiar faces already there. Minato, Yano, Sama, Hiro and Daichi were the only ones he could immediately recognize. The Hokage welcomed Renjiro warmly. Ah, Renjiro, it's good to see you. It has been quite a while since we last met. You've grown considerably, Haruzen remarked a gentle smile on his face. Renjiro gave a respectful bow, though internally he was curious about the Hokage's compliment. What's up with the compliments? 
And why is he talking as if he couldn't just spy on me if he wanted? Renjiro wondered as he took his place beside Sama and Hiro. He couldn't help but notice a figure standing next to the Hokage. Is that Shikaku? No, it can't be. It seems like those Nara clan members are always so formidable, he thought. So this is the boy? Shiba thought as he assessed Renjiro silently. Now that we are all here, I guess we should start. Shiba began, handing out small booklets to everyone except Daichi and Haruzen. The sight of the booklets piqued Renjiro's curiosity. Why are they giving us these? Minato, flipping through the pages, looked puzzled and echoed Renjiro's thoughts. Shiba-sama, why are you giving us bingo books? The Hokage replied, it has been updated. Just take a look at it. Shiba nodded in agreement. Yes, please, look through it carefully. The five shinobi did as they were instructed, their eyes scanning the pages of the updated bingo book. As they reached a particular section, they all stopped suddenly. Yano and Minato exchanged glances, their expressions mirroring their shared shock. Hiro, on the other hand, had a more obvious reaction. Huh? Why am I in the bingo book? He exclaimed his voice laced with disbelief. Sama, who had been silently reading, added, The three of us are all there, pointing to the images of herself, Hiro, and Renjiro. Renjiro's eyes narrowed as he scrutinized the entries. But why are the bounties so high? He finally asked, breaking the silence that had settled over the room. The bounties on the three chunins were 20 million Rio each for both Hiro and Sama, while Renjiro's bounty was an astonishing 25 million Rio. Inasmuch as it was flattering to Renjiro that someone was willing to spend this amount of money to have him killed, he realized that something had gone terribly wrong. They were all just chunins, and this was a higher bounty than even Riku, his former Jounin sensei and an elite Jounin, whose bounty stood at only 15 million Rio. You have a keen eye, Shiba remarked, breaking the silence. Minato's and Yano's bounties have not increased so we can conclude that this is a result of your mission with the Iron Fangs. If it was the Silent Blade, then Minato and Yano's bounties would have definitely increased. But how did they even know that we were involved? We got rid of any evidence and even brought all the bodies to the village, Hiro asked, frustration and confusion evident in his voice. There are many unexplainable jutsus out there that could have revealed your involvement, the Hokage commented his tone calm and instructive. You must always be aware that information can be uncovered in ways we do not yet understand. Renjiro thought back to the mission and couldn't help but wonder how Sama and Hiro had gone so long without having bounties on their heads. Going by the figures, Shiba is probably right, he thought. But why is my bounty higher? Renjiro inquired, voicing the question that had been nagging at him. If we had the same tasks, why is mine higher? he wondered. That we do not know, Daichi responded. It might be due to your actions during the mission or the manner in which the information was gathered. Then it's probably when we were dealing with the Chunins and Jenins at the base of the Iron Fong mercenaries, Renjiro speculated. Yes, that was the only time you were acting separately from us, Yano added. So that must be when they got their information. It explains why your bounty is higher. Hiruzen's expression turned serious. This is no ordinary situation. The high bounties indicate that you are considered significant threats by our enemies. Daichi, who had been silent until now, spoke up. We believe that these bounties are part of a larger strategy by our enemies to destabilize Kanoha. By targeting our promising young shinobi, they aim to weaken our future. Minato nodded in agreement, his expression thoughtful. That makes sense. Hiro, still trying to wrap his head around the situation, asked, What does this mean for us now? Haruzen leaned forward, his gaze intense. It means that you will need to be more vigilant than ever. With such high bounties, it is inevitable that bandits and rogue shinobi will target you. So, it is best if the three of you do not leave the village anytime soon. Daichi added, his tone firm. Renjiro's heart sank at this news. What? I've just become a squad leader. How am I supposed to go on missions with my squad? He thought. The other three did not take this news well either, as it would significantly affect their ability to take on missions. Staying in the village will limit our activities, Sama said. 
her voice tinged with frustration. How are we supposed to work effectively? The safety of our shinobi is paramount, Hiruzen said gently. We cannot risk losing you whenever you step out of the village. As the conversation concluded and the others were dismissed, Renjiro remained in the Hokage's office, a sense of foreboding settling in his stomach. Renjiro, there's more we need to discuss. Hiruzen began, his voice calm but serious. While it's commendable that you've become a squad leader, we must address the immediate danger posed by the bounties on your head. I knew this was coming. Renjiro frowned, feeling a surge of defiance. I understand the risks, but I can take care of myself. I can even use the transformation jutsu to stay hidden. Daichi shook his head. Renjiro, you're still a chunin. Even if you can protect yourself, you'll be putting your squad in danger. Your presence alone will attract threats. Shiba nodded in agreement. There's much more to being a squad leader than just taking missions. You need to understand that leading a squad involves responsibility beyond combat. But taking missions with my squad was what I was most looking forward to, Renjiro thought, his frustration evident. I was going to control when to take missions, that way I could use my time efficiently. Haruzen leaned forward. Renjiro, your safety and the safety of your squad are paramount. We cannot afford to lose you or put your squad members at unnecessary risk. Renjiro's shoulders slumped slightly, the weight of their words pressing down on him. He had envisioned leading his squad into missions, proving himself through action. Now, it seemed that dream was slipping away. Daichi asked, his tone gentle but firm, Renjiro, do you still wish to continue serving in the force? Renjiro stood in the Hokage's office, his mind whirling with thoughts and emotions. This again? He mused. Normally, he would have had to serve in the force for much longer, but Daichi had allowed him to commit to serving in the force for only one year. After that, it would be up to Renjiro whether he wanted to continue or not. Based on his experience so far, Renjiro knew he wouldn't want to stay in the force, as it was too restrictive in terms of personal training time and mission opportunities. The only reason Renjiro had even considered taking up Fujioka's offer to become a squad leader was the access it would grant him to the Uchiha clan's private collection of jutsus. Renjiro had heard that this collection contained jutsus the clan had copied from other shinobi. Dangerous techniques they kept hidden even from the village, and even forbidden Uchiha Jutsus. The allure of these powerful techniques was enough to make Renjiro want to climb the ranks within the Uchiha clan leadership, as it afforded privileges he found too tempting to ignore. I thought we already agreed on this? Or did something else happen? Renjiro wondered, sensing the persistence of Daichi's request. It made him want to reconsider some of his decisions. Currently, Renjiro only saw two paths in front of him. The first involved staying in the police force, sacrificing his much-needed training time. He knew that good work was often rewarded with more work, meaning even less time for his personal growth. The only silver lining was the access to special jutsus, which would undoubtedly enhance his power and combat options. But is it really worth that? Renjiro wondered. The second path involved leaving the force after a few months, allowing him more time for missions and training, thus gaining valuable field experience. I could also gain merit and ask for jutsus from the Hokage like Minato did. Renjiro surmised. Before you answer, Daichi interrupted Renjiro's thoughts. Since you have yet to fill up your squad, why don't you act as a one-man team? This suggestion shocked everyone in the room. What? Renjiro wondered. That removes the issue of me involving my squad in risky situations. Shiba couldn't help but wonder, what is he aiming for? While Hiruzen thought, is he willing to go that far? Renjiro, still a Chunin, was being given an unprecedented offer. Even if he was talented, Hiruzen himself would never go that far. Daichi-sama, Renjiro began. We had already agreed that I would only serve in the police force for a year. That is what I base my future plans on, so I will not change my mind, Renjiro said as politely as he could even adding a tinge of resignation in his voice. While access to those other jutsus is tempting, I can't cut down on my training since the Third Shinobi War is only a few years away. It would be too much of a risk. Besides, I had informed him of this earlier, so this was the path of least resistance, Renjiro thought. 
Daichi took a few moments before he spoke. That's fine. Then your task will be to train your squad members until your time in the force is done, he said. This way, you can still contribute significantly without exposing yourself and your squad to undue danger. Renjiro nodded reluctantly, understanding the logic, but feeling a pang of disappointment. I guess training them is important too, he thought. Well, I tried my best, Daichi thought. He was aware of Renjiro's decision but had hoped to change the boy's mind. He even had a conversation with the Hokage some time ago centering around the boy, so he knew Haruzen had taken an interest in the boy. That was why Daichi was ready to go as far as offering to make Renjiro's squad a one-man team. That was how valuable Renjiro was to him. Unfortunately, he didn't succeed in changing his mind. While Daichi felt bad about the situation, he also felt a bit annoyed. But I can't dwell on this. I have other matters to worry about, Daichi thought. Seeing the resigned look on Daichi's face, Renjiro couldn't help but think, while my relationship with the Uchiha clan has been more about taking than giving, this is not something I can easily compromise. I'm planning on intervening in their revolt and massacre situation, that should be the best thanks I can ever give to them. Renjiro consoled himself, alleviating some of the guilt he felt. I am sure we can come to some sort of compromise on this whole issue, the Hokage remarked, drawing everyone's attention. Why don't we ensure that the missions Renjiro and his squad undertake are within the land of fire or in any of our allied nations? It would be easier for us to reinforce them there in case a situation arises. Shiba took a moment to think about it before he nodded in agreement. That makes sense. We can keep a closer watch and respond quickly if needed. Daichi chimed in as well. I agree. This way, Renjiro can still lead his squad without being exposed to unnecessary risks. This sly fox, compromise, he has never tried to compromise whenever our clan was involved. He clearly knows that this is what the boy wants and he's ready to risk it to give it to him. Daichi inwardly scoffed. While Daichi had promised something similar, his offer only involved risking Renjiro's life, something he couldn't afford to do if other Uchiha clan members in his squad were involved. Renjiro felt a mix of relief and frustration. The compromise was reasonable, but it still meant sacrificing some of his autonomy. Well, at least I can still train and lead my squad, he thought, trying to focus on the positives. Thank you, Hokage-sama, that would be a better way to handle this situation, Renjiro said, bowing slightly. I appreciate the consideration, Haruzen smiled warmly. We believe in your potential, Renjiro. This arrangement is the best way to ensure your safety and that of your squad. Well, that worked out well, Renjiro thought. With the matter settled, Renjiro left the Hokage's office and found Hiro still outside. Renjiro could immediately tell that there was something wrong with his friend. Considering the current events in the village, it wasn't hard to conclude what was bothering him. Hey, Hiro, Renjiro greeted softly, placing a hand on his friend's shoulder. I heard about the news. How are you? Hiro tried to wear a brave face, but Renjiro could clearly tell something was wrong. His eyes, though dry, were filled with sorrow that couldn't be hidden. It's... It's been tough, Renjiro. The clan head's death hit us all hard. Renjiro nodded, his heart aching for his friend. I know. It's never easy losing someone you care about. But we have to stay strong. For their sake. Hiro sighed deeply, the weight of his grief evident in his posture. I just keep thinking. If there was something more I could have done. It was all out of your control, Hiro. We all did. Renjiro said firmly. Well, I still don't know what exactly happened. Leading to Sukumo's suicide. But now is probably not the time to ask. Hiro managed a small, sad smile. Thanks, Renjiro. That means a lot. Renjiro patted his friend on the back. Anytime, Hiro. We're in this together. With their conversation concluded, the two went their separate ways. Hiro towards the Hitaki clan compound while Renjiro made his way to the base. He still had to fill up his squad. Renjiro made his way through the corridors of the Kanoha military force base. Upon reaching the room he was in when the ANBU appeared, Renjiro was greeted by another shinobi waiting for him. Uzumaki Renjiro? The shinobi asked, his voice carrying the weight of formality. Yes, that's me, Renjiro responded. 
The shinobi nodded in acknowledgement. Iwata-san left word for you. Since you were unavailable, the meeting room for your squad has been randomly chosen, as well as your new squad members. Renjiro raised an eyebrow in surprise. I see. And here I was, looking forward to personally choosing them, he said. A hint of disappointment in his voice. However, he quickly shrugged it off. It's not like me choosing them personally would have changed something. Fujioka did not get to choose me and look at how that turned out. Renjiro thought. The shinobi continued. You will have five squad members instead of the usual four. Renjiro tilted his head slightly. Puzzled. Five? Why the change? I thought I was to get four members. He paused, thinking. But five is not a big number. It was the same number Fujioka had when I joined his squad. The shinobi nodded. The decision was made to balance out the skill sets within the team. Or maybe they just wanted to give me more work. Renjiro couldn't help but think. While indeed five was not a huge number, Renjiro had to guide these five shinobi in the new ways of the force. He was also going to be responsible for them, some that Renjiro did not particularly enjoy but had to do. Renjiro sighed, accepting the situation. Understood. Which room has been allocated as our meeting point? The shinobi's eyes softened as if he understood the significance of what he was about to say. Room B12. A smile crept onto Renjiro's face. B12. He thought, the memories flooding back. It was the same room he had used when he was under Fujioka. The room had witnessed countless strategies being formed, plans being discussed, and bonds being forged. It felt almost poetic to be returning there, now as a squad leader himself. At least they got one thing right, he thought. Thank you, Renjiro said, nodding once more. Are the members already there? The shinobi nodded. Yes, they are waiting for you. Iwata-san made sure everything was in order. Renjiro gave a final nod of appreciation and made his way toward the designated room. As he walked, he couldn't help but feel a mixture of excitement and apprehension. Leading a squad was a significant responsibility, and the fact that he hadn't personally chosen his members added an element of unpredictability. Still, he trusted in the process and in the abilities of his new team. Five shinobi sat in a room, their expressions ranging from curious to anxious. The room was spacious and well-lit, with a large wooden table at its center, surrounded by six chairs. Two of the five shinobi, a young girl and a teenage boy, had been engaged in a quiet conversation. I wonder who our squad leader is going to be. The kunoichi mused, her voice carrying a hint of excitement. I hope there's someone experienced. The boy shrugged, a smirk playing on his lips. As long as they're not a hard ass, I'm fine with whoever. Though, I've heard some rumors about a certain Uzumaki who's been making waves lately. The young girl raised an eyebrow, intrigued. Uzumaki? As in, the clan with all the ceiling jutsus, the one that was attacked a couple of years ago. As Renjiro approached room B12, he could hear faint murmurs from inside. He paused for a moment outside the door, taking a deep breath to steady himself. With a firm push, he slid the door open and stepped inside. Before the conversation between the two could continue, Renjiro stepped into the room, closing the door behind him. The room fell silent as the five shinobi turned their full attention to him. As Renjiro stood before his new squad members, he took a moment to observe them carefully, noting their postures, expressions, and the subtle cues that revealed their personalities. He couldn't help but think to himself, Ah, fresh meat. Good afternoon, everyone. He began, his voice steady and confident, setting the tone for the encounter. I'm Uzumaki Renjiro, and I will be your new squad leader. No sooner had the words left his mouth than a hand shot up. It belonged to Uchiha Kudo, a burly and athletic young boy with spiky black hair that fell in a wave pattern over his forehead protector. His sharp, intelligent eyes, paired with his pale complexion and dark attire, gave him an imposing presence. Are you perhaps related to the Uzumaki clan? He asked, curiosity evident in his voice. Before Renjiro could respond, another voice cut in. It was Akira, a young, athletic kunoichi with brown hair and piercing black eyes that seemed to scrutinize Renjiro with every glance. Her sleek, 
customized black jumpsuit, adorned with red accents, highlighted her swift and silent movements. A blue headband with the Leaf Village symbol proudly wrapped around her forehead. Can't you tell from his hair? She interjected. Renjiro chuckled softly and nodded, acknowledging the observation. It wasn't uncommon for him to encounter such reactions. With his striking red hair and the distinctive Sharingan of the Uchiha, he often found himself caught between two worlds. Outsiders frequently assumed he was an Uchiha, while the Uchiha themselves identified him with the Uzumaki. Is this the duality of man? Renjiro mused internally. Despite these mixed perceptions, Renjiro never felt the need to clarify his heritage. It was pointless to argue against what people chose to see. All right, Renjiro continued, bringing the conversation back on track. I'd like each of you to introduce yourselves and tell me your specialties. Kudo was the first to speak. I'm Achiha Kudo, he announced, standing with a confident posture. My speciality is ninjutsu, particularly water and wind nature jutsus. Renjiro nodded, impressed. Next, Achiha Tora stepped forward. He was a lean, athletic boy with black eyes that mirrored the night sky and a sharp jawline. His raven hair was cropped short, and he wore a black jumpsuit under a green flak jacket. I'm Tora. My speciality is taijutsu and swordsmanship, he stated, his voice calm but with an underlying intensity. Ha! Huh. I'd like to see how experienced he is with them, Renjiro thought, intrigued by Tora's mention of swords. The next to speak was Achiha Miki. She was petite yet fiery. Her raven hair was tied back in a sleek ponytail that swayed with her movements. She wore the traditional black and navy blue garb of the Uchiha clan, adorned with the clan's emblem on her back. Her forehead protector was worn proudly on her head. I'm Miki, she said with a firm voice. My speciality is also ninjutsu. Uchiha Akira followed. I'm Akira. My specialties are ninjutsu and taijutsu, she declared. Her confidence was palpable, matching her poised appearance. Finally, Achiha Shoda introduced himself. He was a lean boy with sharp, angular features and jet black hair. His piercing black eyes seemed to reflect a fiery spirit within. He wore the standard Achiha black outfit with blue accents, and his forearms were wrapped in bandages. I'm Shoda and my speciality is taijutsu, he said simply, his tone steady and serious. As Renjiro listened to each introduction, he couldn't help but note the age difference between himself and his new squad members. They're all older than me, he thought, recalling the files he had read on his way to the room. The oldest among them were Shoda and Akira, both 14. Miki and Tora were 13, while Kudo was 12, just a few months older than Renjiro himself. For most of his life after the academy, Renjiro had been surrounded either by his age mates or by far older shinobi who respected him for his skills. Now, he found himself in a unique dynamic. As the youngest yet the leader, he knew he had to solidify his position quickly. It seems that we are all experienced. Renjiro began, his tone neutral but with a hint of challenge. Why don't we move this to the training ground to demonstrate our skills? He proposed, earning curious looks from the group. The six of them made their way to the training ground, a wide open space surrounded by tall trees. The late afternoon sun cast long shadows across the area, adding a dramatic flair to the setting. As they arrived, Renjiro turned to face his squad, a smirk playing on his lips. Come at me, all of you, he declared. Ha! Huh. Akira muttered, surprise evident in her voice. Beside her, the other four squad members wore similar expressions of disbelief. We should all attack you at the same time? Kudo managed to ask, still processing the unusual instruction. His confusion was mirrored in the faces of his teammates. Yes, that is what I meant, Renjiro confirmed, his tone calm but authoritative. Despite his reassurance, the five were still hesitant. Mickey, in particular, was deep in thought. While he is our squad leader, he is also a Chunin like us. There shouldn't be much of a difference between us and him since he only became a Chunin a couple of months ago. Seeing that none of them were moving, Renjiro decided to take matters into his own hands. I actually did not get a chance to use my weapon, 
so this might be a good time to use it. With that thought, he retrieved his staff from behind his back. The sleek, black weapon gleamed under the afternoon sun, a testament to its craftsmanship and deadliness. The sight of it seemed to snap the group out of their stupor. They immediately shifted their stances, readying themselves for whatever Renjiro had planned. Still, they hesitated. Renjiro's smirk deepened as he realized their reluctance. Fine, he said, his voice carrying an edge of challenge. If you won't attack, then I'll come to you. In an instant, Renjiro seemed to vanish. He then reappeared behind Mickey, swinging his staff down with swift, calculated precision. With her senses blaring at her, Mickey barely had time to react. Instinctively, she activated her Sharingan, the three Tomo spinning to life in her eyes. With a flicker, she vanished just in time, the sound of Renjiro's staff slamming into the ground behind her echoing through the clearing. Crack! The impact left a visible web of fractures on the earth where Mickey had stood moments before. As she appeared a few meters away, her heart racing, one thought dominated her mind. Fast! He's fast! But Renjiro gave them no respite. He was already moving toward his next target, Kudo. The young Achiha barely had time to register Renjiro's approach before a fist was flying towards him. Reacting on instinct, Kudo twisted his body, narrowly dodging the punch. His eyes widened, and he quickly adjusted his stance, preparing for the next move. Meanwhile, Akira seized the opportunity to attack from a distance. She launched three shurikens at Renjiro with a flick of her wrist, her eyes watching closely. However, Renjiro didn't flinch. He simply raised his staff, split it into two batons, and with a deft flick, caught the shurikens in midair, inserting one of the batons into the eye of each projectile. If you're going to do that, you need to be more creative, Renjiro chided, his voice carrying a hint of amusement. He wasn't done. In one smooth motion, Renjiro released the bladed end of his other baton and sliced through the nearly invisible strings attached to the shurikens. The cut was clean, precise, and left Akira momentarily stunned. How? How did he see my string? He's not even using his Sharingan. She thought, her mind racing. She knew that Renjiro was able to dodge a few projectiles coming at him, so she planned on using her strings so that she could control the trajectory of the shurikens and give him a harder time dealing with them. But Renjiro had seen through her ploy with unsettling ease. Renjiro didn't waste any time. He flicked his wrist, sending the shurikens back toward Akira. Thunk! Thunk! They flew through the air, embedding themselves in the ground and the tree behind her with an eerie precision. Immediately after, Tora lunged forward, his twin swords gleaming. Now this is more like it, Renjiro thought, his eyes gleaming with excitement. With a swift motion, he blocked Tora's attack using his two batons. But Tora was relentless, launching a flurry of strikes at Renjiro. The two of them moved in a blur, weapon meeting weapon in a symphony of combat. Renjiro's batons danced in his hands, effortlessly parrying and deflecting Tora's attacks. The two seemed evenly matched, their movements almost synchronized. Renjiro's familiarity with swords was limited, but the lessons he'd absorbed over the years served him well. He recalled the graceful yet deadly movements of Hiro with his saber and the meticulous teachings of Riku, who had instructed him in the basics of bladed weapons. These experiences allowed Renjiro to anticipate Tora's attacks, reading the flow of his movements with an almost instinctual ease. Good posture and movements, the only thing he is lacking is speed and power. Renjiro mused as he sidestepped a few kanai aimed at him, leaving Tora vulnerable. The young swordsman struggled to dodge the projectiles, his form breaking as he tried to recover. A moment later, Mickey launched another attack, her voice clear and commanding, fire style. Phoenix Sage Flower Nail Crimson, the burning projectiles flew toward Renjiro, but he didn't bother using his batons this time. He stored them and with a fluid somersault, he avoided the scorching flames, landing gracefully a few meters away. But Renjiro barely had time to pause as Kudo fired a series of wind bullets at him. I just have to continue dodging, Renjiro thought, his movements a blur as he evaded the gusts. 
He was walking a fine line between pushing the Chunins to their limits without causing them any real harm. He could have ended the skirmish swiftly, but there was value in letting them showcase their abilities and work together. It was a balancing act, challenging them while ensuring no harm befall them. After all, where would the fun be if he didn't let them stretch their limits? Seeing her initial projectiles avoided, Mickey decided to change tactics. She formed a hand sign and shouted, Fire style! Great fireball jutsu! A massive ball of flames erupted from her mouth, hurtling towards Renjiro. At the same time, Kudo amplified the attack with his winds, intensifying the fiery onslaught. Akira, observing the situation, saw an opening. She quickly summoned a large scroll, unfurling it with a flourish. In an instant, hundreds of weapons materialized, all aimed at Renjiro. Three long-range attacks, good. At least now they have a semblance of a team, Renjiro thought, impressed by their coordination. But then, the ground beneath him shifted, and two figures emerged. Shoda and Tora, who had been lying in wait for a sneak attack, shouted, Fire style! Searing migraine, and sent a beam of fire at Renjiro. It's supposed to be a sneak attack, but why are they shouting? Renjiro thought, bemused. The beam collided with the incoming fireball and wind-enhanced flames, creating a massive explosion. Boom! The shockwave rippled through the training ground, sending debris flying and kicking up a thick cloud of dust. Did we get him? Akira asked, her voice tinged with a mix of hope and disbelief. As the smoke began to clear, a half-smile played on her lips as they saw Renjiro standing, albeit battered. He was panting, with burns and wounds evident on his body and burnt patches on his clothing. He looked barely able to stand. Yes, we dash Akira's triumphant shout was cut short. Without warning, she collapsed, unconscious before she could even finish her sentence. Shoda, sensing something amiss, immediately leapt back. His instincts proved correct as Renjiro's kick struck the ground where Shoda had been standing a moment before, leaving a deep crater. As expected, if that attack had gotten him, I would be disappointed in our squad leader, Shoda thought, taking the initiative to launch a series of palm strikes at Renjiro. His Sharingan was active as he tried to predict Renjiro's movements. But Renjiro was unarmed so he blocked each of Shoda's attacks with ease. There was no hesitation in his movements, only precise and fluid counteractions. Why is he slow? Is he getting tired? Shoda wondered, disappointment creeping in. Is dodging all you are going to do? Shoda taunted, hoping to provoke a reaction. Renjiro's calm reply caught him off guard. Yes, that is what I am planning on doing, he said, surprising Shoda. Despite his best efforts, Shoda's attacks continued to meet Renjiro's flawless defenses. As the battle raged on, Shoda spared a glance around him. His eyes widened in shock as he noticed that Tora, Akira, Mickey, and even Kudo were all unconscious, strewn across the training ground. How? Shoda thought. Just then, Renjiro's voice rang out, clear and commanding. I've seen enough. The declaration was accompanied by a sudden surge of chakra, and before Shoda could react, his vision blurred and darkness consumed him. The room was eerily silent, save for the faint shuffling of bodies. One by one, the five Chunin began to stir, groaning softly as they regained consciousness. They found themselves back in the same room where they had first met their squad leader. Shoda was the first to speak, his voice groggy and disoriented. What happened? He muttered, rubbing his temples as if trying to massage away the confusion. He glanced around, taking in the sight of his teammates in various states of discomfort. Akira sat up next, wincing as she gingerly touched a tender spot on her arm. Her mind was a haze, the memories of the fight fading in and out. We... We were fighting Renjiro and then... Her voice trailed off, unable to connect the dots of their sudden defeat. Was it Genjutsu? She wondered, the possibility flickering in her mind. Mickey, still lying on the floor, stared blankly at the ceiling. Her eyes were wide, a mix of disbelief and frustration evident in her gaze. How did we end up here? And did we really lose consciousness? She asked, 
her voice tinged with incredulity. It was a hard pill to swallow, the reality of their defeat gnawing at her pride. Tora, clutching his side where a fresh bruise had formed, nodded in agreement. I don't know. I just remember seeing him battered. He admitted, his voice thick with frustration. The image of Renjiro, seemingly vulnerable, lingered in his mind, a stark contrast to the outcome they were now facing. Kudo was the last to sit up, his expression thoughtful. He replayed the moments before everything went black, Renjiro's calm demeanor, the futile attempts of their team to land a decisive blow. It was the squad leader, Renjiro, he finally said, breaking the silence. He knocked you guys out while we were fighting and then, I can't remember what happened after. His voice trailed off as he struggled to recall the exact sequence of events. The last thing he remembered was Renjiro's words before he lost consciousness. I didn't even see his Sharingan during the fight, so he must have been holding back. By a lot. Wait, he is an Uzumaki, right? Does he even have a Sharingan? He should. I remember hearing about him during his Chunin exams final. Kudo's thoughts raced, his head throbbing with the effort. He decided it was best not to overwork his brain with unnecessary speculation. Tora's words seemed to resonate with the others, sparking a chain of similar recollections. Each of them remembered seeing Renjiro seemingly on the brink of collapse, only for everything to go dark moments later. They exchanged puzzled looks, gradually coming to a troubling conclusion. Renjiro had used a genjutsu on them, but how? None of them had seen him activate the Sharingan. It was then that Renjiro entered the room, his presence immediately commanding attention. It seems you are all awake, he said with a smile, his voice calm and collected. His expression was unreadable, a stark contrast to the subtle tension that filled the room. The Chunins couldn't help but feel a twinge of fear at his arrival. They had come into this expecting to overpower Renjiro with their numbers, confident in their collective strength. Yet, they couldn't even manage to put him in a dangerous situation, let alone defeat him. The realization was a humbling one, and it hung heavy in the air, unspoken but understood. Gathering her courage, Mickey was the first to voice the question on everyone's mind. Excuse me, Renjiro-sama. How did we get back here? The last thing most of us remember is seeing you battered. She asked her tone a mix of curiosity and caution. Her eyes locked onto Renjiro, searching for any hint of deception. Renjiro-sama? It seemed my plan worked. Renjiro thought as he took a moment before responding, his gaze sweeping over each of them assessing their condition and expressions. First of all, you all did well today. Though the outcome was expected, you showed a lot of potential. He began, his tone even and reassuring. After I knocked you all out, I brought you here. This is the squad's resting area. I figured you'd need some time to recover. He gestured around the room, indicating the sparse but comfortable surroundings they had woken up in. Mickey frowned, her mind still grappling with the reality of their situation. But, how did you knock us all out? She asked, her voice betraying a hint of vulnerability. While they had speculated on how Renjiro would have done it, hearing him confirm it would be way better than the current world of speculation they were living in. Renjiro leaned back, crossing his arms over his chest. As for how, let's just say I used a bit of genjutsu, he explained a small, knowing smile playing on his lips. You were all focused on attacking, and I took advantage of that. His words hung in the air, a simple explanation that carried the weight of their collective defeat. Genjutsu? But he didn't even use his Sharingan. Is it possible to even do that without the Sharingan? Shota wondered, his mind racing. The rest seemed to be having similar thoughts. How is he still a Chunin? He is definitely not like us. Kira thought. Is the difference between us and him that much? Shota thought. They had always prided themselves on their proficiency with dojitsu, yet here they were, outmaneuvered by a fellow Chunin without so much as a visible use of his Sharingan. The realization stung, bruising their pride. Unbeknownst to them, Renjiro had actually used his Sharingan during the fight. It was just that it was so fast that they did not realize it. He had used it for a split second to knock them out with a genjutsu. 
This was not a coincidence as Renjiro had been working on this for a while. After realizing that many of his opponents instinctively raised their guard at the sight of his Sharingan, he devised a strategy to counteract this disadvantage. He would either use Genjutsu immediately, attempting to catch his opponents off guard before they could react, or wait for the perfect moment to strike. It was a strategy born out of necessity, a way to level the playing field. However, it came with its own set of challenges. Using less of his Sharingan meant sacrificing one of his most potent tools, effectively handicapping himself. But Renjiro had been working on ways to compensate for this, honing his skills and techniques to ensure he could still hold his own. Good thing my opponents weren't stronger this time, Renjiro thought to himself. The split second I used my Jinjutsu was enough to overwhelm them. If they were stronger, things would have been more complicated. Renjiro continued, his voice calm but firm. This wasn't just a test of your combat abilities. It was also a lesson. In the field, you won't always have the luxury of facing enemies one-on-one. -on -one. You'll be outnumbered, outgunned, and outmaneuvered. You need to learn to adapt, to think on your feet, and to rely on each other. His words were a sobering reminder of the reality they faced as shinobi. The room fell silent as the weight of his words settled over them, each of them absorbing the lesson they had learned today. He then moved on to individual critiques. For Tora, he advised, Work on your speed and power if you plan to continue using your blades. Your form is good, but you need to hit harder and faster. Tora nodded. He knew Renjiro was right. His attacks lacked the necessary force and agility that he considered best. He resolved to improve to sharpen his skills. Turning to Shota, Renjiro continued, don't neglect your Jinjutsu and Ninjutsu. Being well-rounded is better than focusing on just one aspect. Once all your skills are at an acceptable level, then you can specialize. Shota listened intently, acknowledging the truth in Renjiro's words. He had always favored Taijutsu, but this experience had shown him the importance of versatility. For the others, Renjiro emphasized the importance of close combat. It's crucial in every confrontation. It might just save your life when you're low on chakra, he advised. The trio nodded. They had relied too heavily on long-range attacks, neglecting the fundamentals of close combat. Renjiro then stood up. It's already evening, so go rest and recover. We'll resume training tomorrow. And remember, this is just the beginning. We have a lot of work ahead of us. With that, he turned and left the room. The five Chunin sat in silence, each lost in their thoughts. It was late in the evening when Renjiro found himself standing outside Iwata's office, a modest door that bore the marks of time and countless visitors. In the hierarchy of the police force, most leadership positions were accompanied by dedicated offices, spaces where strategies were devised, and plans were meticulously laid out. However, the squad leader position was an exception. Tasked with overseeing a smaller group, their role was more dynamic and hands-on, often requiring them to be in the field alongside their squad. As such, Renjiro, despite his rank, had no formal office to call his own, making these meetings in Iwata's office a necessity for discussing matters of squad progress and strategy. Renjiro did not mind at all as dealing with reports that he had to submit was already a burden enough. He couldn't imagine sitting in an office most of the time as a shinobi. Knock! 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 Renjiro knocked on the door, the sound resonating in the quiet hallway. A moment later, the door creaked open, and Iwata's voice called out, Come in! Renjiro stepped inside, closing the door behind him. The room was simple but functional, with a large wooden desk cluttered with papers and scrolls. Iwata looked up from his paperwork, a small smile tugging at the corners of his lips. Renjiro! He greeted motioning for the squad leader to come closer. Good to see you. How's the squad faring? It's been more than a month since you took charge, right? Yes, more than a month, he confirmed. The squad's making good progress. We've been focusing primarily on team formations and tactics. I didn't see the need to deal with their physical and combat training. They're Chunin, after all. I trust them to handle those aspects responsibly. Iwata nodded, leaning back in his chair. That makes sense. 
At their level, they should already have a good grasp of the basics from their Genin days. Your job is more about refining their teamwork and preparing them for the complexities of real missions. Yes, Renjiro agreed. Each member has their strengths, and my goal has been to optimize those while ensuring they work seamlessly as a unit. Take Kudo, for instance. He's shown a natural aptitude for leadership and decision-making. He remains calm under pressure and considers all angles before making a move. Because of that, I've decided to make him the assistant squad leader. Iwata raised an eyebrow, a hint of surprise crossing his face. Kudo, huh? I've heard good things about him. That sounds like a wise choice. How have the others been faring? Renjiro took a moment, collecting his thoughts before responding. Mickey has been focusing on her mid to close range attacks. She's gotten better at managing her chakra, which has been a weak point in the past. Akira, on the other hand, has been improving her close combat skills. She was primarily a distance fighter, but now she's getting more comfortable up close. Awata listened intently, nodding along as Renjiro spoke. And Shoda? How's he integrating into the team dynamics? Shoda's been a challenge, Renjiro admitted. He's skilled, no doubt about it, but he's too focused on taijutsu. I've been encouraging him to diversify, to not neglect his jinjutsu and ninjutsu. A well-rounded shinobi is a more effective one. He's starting to see the value in that, slowly but surely. And Tora? Iwata inquired, his voice carrying a note of curiosity. Tora's made significant strides in his speed and power, Renjiro replied. He's always been precise with his blade, but now he's putting more force behind his strikes. There's still room for improvement, but he's on the right path. Iwato leaned forward, resting his elbows on the desk. It sounds like you've got a good handle on things. I'm impressed with the progress you've made in such a short time. Renjiro smiled modestly, reaching into his vest to pull out a folded report. Thank you. I've put together a detailed report on their progress and training sessions over the past month. He handed the scroll to Iwata, who took it with a nod of appreciation. As Iwata scanned the report, Renjiro continued, Based on what I've seen, I believe the squad is ready for their first mission. They've demonstrated good teamwork and individual growth, and I think it's time to put their skills to the test. Iwata looked up from the report, his expression serious. Are you sure about that? It's a big step and the safety of the squad is your responsibility. Renjiro met Iwata's gaze, his eyes steady and confident. I'm sure. They're ready. A mission will give them a chance to apply what they've learned. It's the next logical step in their development. Iwata considered Renjiro's words carefully, weighing the decision. After a moment, he nodded. All right, I trust your judgment. However, due to your... Unique situation, he said, choosing his words carefully. We need to be mindful of the missions we choose. Your bounty makes you a target, and we can't afford to draw unnecessary attention. Ah, he has said it, now definitely something will happen. Renjiro thought as his expression remained calm, though a slight tension flickered in his eyes. The mention of his bounty was a reminder of the complexities that accompanied his position. Understood, he replied. What do you propose? I'll handpick a few missions that I believe are suitable, Iwata explained. Missions that minimize the risk of exposure while still providing a meaningful challenge for the squad. You'll review them and choose the one you think is best. Renjiro nodded, his face thoughtful. That sounds fair. I trust your judgment in selecting appropriate missions. Iwata smiled a rare but genuine expression. Good. I'll have a selection ready for you by tomorrow morning. You can brief your squad after you make your choice. Renjiro stood, smoothing out his vest. Thank you, Iwata-sama. I appreciate your support. He inclined his head respectfully before turning to leave the office. As he reached the door, Iwata's voice called out, Renjiro. Renjiro paused, looking back over his shoulder. Yes, take care out there, Iwata said his tone carrying an unspoken concern. And keep an eye on your squad. They look up to you. Renjiro offered a small, reassuring smile. I will. And thank you again. With that, he exited the room, 
closing the door softly behind him. One of the perks of becoming a squad leader was an upgrade in accommodation. Renjiro had moved from the modest apartment he'd occupied since arriving in the village to a more spacious and well-appointed home. The new place was a marked improvement, featuring not only more living space, but also a basement that Renjiro had quickly converted into an indoor training ground. This addition was particularly valuable, allowing him to continue his personal training and hone his skills away from prying eyes. In the past month, Renjiro had been juggling multiple responsibilities, his duties with the police force, training his new squad and fortifying his new home with an array of SEALs. The SEALs were a crucial addition, designed to make spying on him more difficult. Given his closer proximity to the heart of the Uchiha clan compound, this was a necessary precaution. Ensuring his privacy and security was paramount. Despite the busyness of his schedule, one thing Renjiro hadn't had the chance to do was visit the clan's private library. It was a place Renjiro had been eager to explore, but his time was business, and it was not on top of the list of his priorities currently. Hopefully, after the squad's first mission, I'll have the time to visit, he thought. Once the mission was complete and his responsibilities temporarily lessened, he planned to delve into the private library. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.